My favorite quote from M. Scott Peck, the avoidance of pain is the beginning of all unhealthy behavior. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another uh, edition of The Patrick Doyle Show. I'm Patrick Doyle, and today I'm joined, as usual, by Amber Lynn. Amber is the Community Relations Director for Pathway to Hope, which is an online membership program that we created to help women in difficult circumstances, uh, toxic relationships, emotional abuse, and even in family situations, not necessarily marriages. Um, it's been very helpful for a lot of women, and uh, so you can check that out at patrickdoyle.life. Um, so I've had a lot of requests. Um, I did this video a long time ago. It's called 10 Signs You're a Survivor or 10 Signs You're a Victim. And so in emotionally destructive relationships, people get very confused about whether they're victimized or whether they're surviving. And that has to do with the fact that usually abusers are always undermining you and having you doubt your own perceptions. So this list evidently has been very helpful to a lot of people. So I wanted to go over it again and uh, put it out there one more time. And uh, so Amber is going to also join in the conversation as we go through the 10 signs that you're a survivor or the 10 signs you're a victim. Absolutely. So, well, you, let's go ahead and go through the 10 signs you are a victim first. Okay. Okay. Before we do that, just let me yeah. say this. Um, okay. Listen, one thing I think that everyone has ever, that who has ever lived or ever will live, one thing all humans have in common is injustice. No one has ever been able to escape injustice. So how we cope with injustice is more important than whether or not we have it because we're all in that boat. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we often deal with the injustice in ways that are very harmful. So what you have here in this side, this, this uh, list of 10 signs you're a survivor, 10 signs you're a victim is it's really how are we dealing with the injustice that we've had? Are we using uh, resources to get better or are we staying in the spin of whatever it is that happened to us? Mm -hmm. So key component of this is for you to get to freedom whether you're a survivor or whether you're uh you know a victim listen we've all been in the victim status so i don't want anybody to hear me say victim as a negative thing look yeah. i've been victimized i've been abused i've been harmed that is real because i've been victimized it doesn't make me a victim but a lot of people have a victim stance and this is really what I'm getting at. And by no means do I mean it in a derogatory sense. I mean it as a descriptor. You see the victimization stance in someone's behavior. And that's important for you to see both in other people and also in yourself. Mm -hmm. So you, can, you can't you can move to survivor if you don't see that you're staying in a victim stance. It's, it's re required for you to see. So these 10 steps are intended to help you gain clarity. I don't want anybody hearing this video and judging themselves or others or shaming yourself or others for the behaviors. It's just simply a way to find clarity, not, yeah. not to be harmed, not to be harmful. Yeah, that's great it, distinction there. Okay, so number one, 10 signs you were a victim. Uh, you complain rather than act. Yes. So, um, you you you've probably experienced this with people where um they talk a lot about the same stuff they have the same problems that never go anywhere they never get any better and it's just a long unending conversation about this and that and the other and they don't ever when you if you were to suggest a solution they would find a barrier mm. you ever had that conversation with somebody where you're like oh. well have you ever tried this well yeah i tried that it doesn't work well, have you tried this? Well, yeah, no, I can't do that because da, 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 da. Yeah. So the problem can't be resolved. So they complain rather than act. Totally. That makes sense. All right. Number two. And I've never done it, by the way. You've never done it? <laughs> yeah, right. It's a joke. I, I spent many years of my life in that situation. Yeah. I like what you said in the beginning. Like we all go through this process. So um, 10 signs you were a victim. Number two is talk about the same problems over and over again. Mm -hmm. Very similar about complaining. But what you find is there, so complaining is a little different in that they're sort of uh, whining about it. They're, yeah. um, you know, 
talking about how bad their situation is. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, is that it's always a part of their conversation. Have you ever uh, talked to anybody like no matter it's like, hey, how is the baseball game? And you end up talking about the thing that they're bothered by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They always seem to slip it in. So what it reveals is a preoccupation in their mind about this thing. And because it doesn't move, then, you know, it's it becomes a, a topic of conversation at a high percentage of the time. Now, not obviously not every time, gotcha. but it's, it's also it's. What I'm trying to get at is the person's mind is on this a lot and it mm. becomes their identity mm. in terms of how they communicate, what the kind of things they say. It always it acts like a filter through which they hear or see most things. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever that trauma is or whatever that thing is that's unresolved in them or the thing that they don't feel like they can get past or the harm that's been done to them. It, it doesn't move. It just keeps they keep talking about it. Gotcha. All right. Uh, 10 signs you're a victim. Number three, you're never able to get to resolution. Right. And that is simply most often about the lack of the bill, the lack of willingness to take action. Mm. So I'd rather talk about it than do deal with it. Talk or complain, but like you're talk saying. Or complain, yeah. It's yeah. something I'm, I'm always, always on my mind. But when it comes to taking action, I'd rather talk about it and avoid the action than to do something. Um, and as we get into this, the, to the 10 signs you're a survivor, you'll see the contrast. But yeah. just know that the person is without resolution, not because there aren't things that can be resolved. Like, let's say you have uh, uh, an abusive relationship and the person keeps talking about it or well, rather than talking about it, they could take action, but they keep, they keep talking about it and avoiding the action and they're talking about it is the way they avoid the action. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 10 signs you are a victim. Number four, you're always looking to people to save you. Yes. So this is the process where we, we externalize the solution. So it, it, there's, it doesn't matter what I do. It, I, can't, I can't help the situation. I got to find somebody who's an expert. I got to find somebody who's got power. I got to find somebody who can help me with this and pull me out of it. So their, their first instinct is to externalize it rather than look at themselves. Rather than get honest, they start looking out. OK, and this is a very common survivor tactic, because when you're in danger. You know, you're always looking out to try to find a way to be safe. Yeah. Right. So and if you look inside in a dangerous environment, that's too overwhelming because you'll see all that pain. So mm -hmm. you tend to look out. And so when you start to come out of this. The alternative, instead of looking to other people to save me, I start to see my own, my own reality. And that's, that's what I begin to work on instead of it always being external. And in the church, I noticed as a pastor for many years, there were, there were many people that they were in the pastor's office all the time, same problems, nothing changes, you know, yeah. uh, and, and it, it happens in counseling. It happens in hospitals. It happens everywhere where people are just in the hospital, we used to call them resource eaters. They just took up space and kept coming and but there was never any resolution. Mm. Interesting. So in a situation like that, it seems like they're seeking something, but it's not actually to solve their problems. Yeah. Well, what, what they it? what they want is the attention generally, which gives them a moment of validation about okay. the issue. Okay, right. And then so we put a bandaid on it and they feel better for a minute and then they go back, but then nothing, nothing's resolved. So mm -hmm. when you've been harmed and every survivor, I mean, every victim has been harmed. Mm -hmm. So when you've been harmed, you don't trust yourself. You don't believe yourself. You don't like yourself. Generally, you might even think that you're no good, but you're not saying that to anybody, but these behaviors are a revelation of that. Yeah. So they're getting external validation rather than internal, knowing that they are enough just the way that they are and they can take right. steps which towards. Is, 
right. saving themselves rather right. than which is why they can never them. be safe. This is why they can never be satiated or satisfied because they're getting it from something that they have to keep getting. Totally. I've been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. How, how do you think I know about this stuff? <laughs> All right. 10 signs you are a victim. Uh, number five, you don't accept responsibility. There's always someone or something to blame. Mm -hmm. So this is the avoidance of the pain. This is really what it's about. It's about avoiding the pain. It's not about being weak or bad or unhealthy. I mean, those things are, those things can be true, but generally the reason why we, we do this is because we don't want to face the pain. So we're always making excuses as to why we can't engage in something or the other that would move us in a direction of health. Gotcha. So we use it as a way to avoid that process. Okay. 10 times you are a victim. Number six, you take more than you give. Mm -hmm. So this is a theme you heard it in, you know, one and two. So <clears throat> on, and I would say, not necessarily, uh, I would say primarily in an emotional way. Mm. There's a lot of need. Mm -hmm. So in a relationship, they tend to pull on someone. They tend mm -hmm. to be the one that is, uh, you know, taking emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the flip side of this, you know, to stay in a victim stance is to be the, always the giver. That's the flip side of it. So you have. Yeah one side is take 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 and the other side is give 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 so there's never a balance so both are avoidances gotcha all right 10 signs you were a victim number seven you are uncomfortable with being emotionally well yes <clears throat> so this goes back to what i was saying when you've been harmed and the message from that harm is that you're inadequate you're not good enough you're broken you're defective you're not worth the skin you're printed in mm -hmm. If you believe that, you know, then, then you, if you start to make some changes and your life starts to go well, mm -hmm. it feels like you're breaking some sort of cosmic rule and you're doing something wrong to yeah. be okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's a process that we all go through to like be okay, like be in a place where we're okay with being well. When yeah. you've been blamed and told you the, the wrong, you're a bad person, you're inadequate, all that, then when you do feel well, you feel like it's really uncomfortable. And I've said many times that yeah. being genuinely loved is the most difficult thing you could do <laughs> because of the level of vulnerability that it creates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as somebody who's a survivor of hardship, trauma, abuse, being vulnerable is the last thing I want to do. Yeah. But being well requires vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can think of a situation just recently where I've noticed for myself that sometimes because I've been abandoned by both parents that, you know, the message in my head or my mind tells me is that you're going to be abandoned. So as soon as I have a good connection with somebody, my mind almost tries sabotaging rather than being exactly. happy and like enjoying that connection in that moment, you know, like a sunset sort of, you know, with somebody, my mind is already trained to think of the worst case scenario, what's going to happen. Oh, they're just going to leave or, you know, whatever, ABC. Yeah. So I've had to like really focus on rewiring or retraining my mind into not um, creating problems that aren't really existing instead of just enjoying the moments and yes. actually being so, happy that's, question mark like yeah. it's a foreign concept kind of that yeah. is a great that's a great example of exactly what i'm talking about because the training from the abuse is so deep we're unconscious about it yeah and it takes becoming conscious and uncomfortable to change yeah right and so when you're uh, in that space and you're feeling good and you're feeling cared about and then your mind tells you you're going to be abandoned or what my mind used to tell me is that not so much i was going to be abandoned but once they get to know you they're not going to like you yeah they're going to reject you because you're this and you're my mind would tell me all those things and you know that was my dad who was a you know ptsd two war alcoholic uh you know, God bless him, but he implanted those things, you know, and put them deep in there. So I just want to encourage anybody, look, this is not an event. And yeah, it's one of the things that I struggle with and have struggled with, you know, all the years being in the church is us talking about these kind of changes being instantaneous. 
that is not possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm telling you, this is somebody who <laughs> at one point in my life was a Pentecostal and, you know, looked at the miraculous as something that happened every day. Mm -hmm. But if you look at God's world, <clears throat> nothing changes quickly. No. A caterpillar doesn't come a butterfly overnight. You know, the seasons don't change in an instant. It takes time. Mm -hmm. Everything has a process to it. So when someone says, I changed, and this is the other thing I say to people that are in relationships where there's harm, and then the, the harmful person has an epiphany as now they're going to, they're completely changed. Mm -hmm. That is never true. <laughs> Yeah. Just so you know, that's a lie. No yeah. one changes. Like you and I are talking about our parents mistreated us. It took mm -hmm. a lot of effort and energy to get to the place where we started to see ourselves outside of their lies. Yes. So true. So this is what uh, we're, we're addressing here in this, in this um, instant. Totally. Ten times you are a victim. We are on number eight. You are in crisis more than not. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you feel more comfortable in crisis, like we just talked about. You feel more comfortable in crisis than you do in comfort or you do in safety or peace. Yeah. So you actually unconsciously will create it. Yeah. And that can be practically or even just like in your mind. Right. Because I know for me, my mind is just like I could be at a most peaceful situation and my mind is just swirling and building worst case scenarios to the moon and back. Exactly. And I'm like, what the That's heck? Exactly but I've also true. met people where they literally like bring on like drama into their life. Like it's always just chaos. One thing after another, like self-sabotage in a way. I don't know, but. Yes. Well, see, <clears throat> that's exactly true. And I'm glad you said that Amber, because, you know, internally is where the most of the chaos is. Mm. It may lead to external relational, uh, uh, you know, I've certainly, I mean, I've been around people who are chaotic and, you know, you can't, you can't have a relationship without, within, without there always being some level of drama. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but when you talk about that internal process, this is what I'm talking about is becoming aware that you're sabotaging yourself is imperative for you yeah. getting to a place of health, mm -hmm. emotionally speaking. And I think that would lead to if your emotional health will always lead to better physical health. But um, the getting uh, so if you're always looking to other people and you're always internally spinning, mm -hmm. how are you going to get to a place of health? Well, you got to recognize that's what I'm doing. I think this is why this list has been so helpful to people because they can see that that's what they're doing. But then they see the signs of a survivor and they go, okay, ping pong, back and forth, ping pong, back and forth. Ping, yeah. That's how it works. Um, yeah. I always talk about it being like the inchworm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going nowhere. It seems like inching, but really I'm inching along a little <laughs> at a time. And, and I think the change being slow is actually a mercy. Because if it went too fast, your head would explode. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to handle this too much. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Um, I don't know if this goes with what we're talking about or not, but I know I've told you before, like sloths, like obviously they're really slow moving yeah. like creatures. Yeah. But I don't know if you know this, but um, a lot of them, they end up like dying via suicide because they'll be up in a tree and instead of grabbing a branch, they end up grabbing their own arm and then falling to their death. So it's like a horrible image of that, but it's like, that's like self-sabotage in some way, right? Yes, like exactly. grabbing your own arm and allowing yourself falling to your death. Like it's a really tragic image, but um, mm -hmm. in reality that happens with loss. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. You, you, you can't on your own uh, uh, internally solve all these things yeah exactly all right 10 times you are a victim um number nine you make people around you tired does that need any explanation i don't think so yeah, yeah. um that's because of the nature of demand like yeah. all the emotional needs and the i need i need validation i need information and i need cor you know correction i need bible verses i need prayer i need i need i need um and, you know, those things are true, but there, there has to be some sort of process that's moving you away from staying in that loop. Yeah. And I think in the church, we're really bad at uh, enabling people instead of confronting them. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean confronting them like you're a bad, I mean, like in love, like, 
Yeah. You see what's happening here and this is harming you and this is harming those around you. And yeah. Instead, so, just smiling and going, okay. Yeah. In a situation where someone is a victim and they're kind of in that spinny state, mm -hmm. do they even have the awareness that they're making people tired? No. Not so then when you talk Not about generally. the confrontation, wouldn't it be caring for someone to be like, you're making me really tired right yeah. now? Yeah. How else are they supposed to know, right? I've had that conversation with many people. Okay. Uh, you know, you're wearing me out. You, and when, particularly when I was in the church uh, as a pastor, you know, it, I, you can't do this anymore. Like we've had 15 conversations and we're still talking about the same thing and everything we've tried hasn't worked. Mm. So, you know, there's a deeper problem here. The gen generally, though, when that confrontation happens, they go somewhere else. That's been my experience. <laughs> then you're not tired anymore. <laughs> right. And this is, this is why I say to people, like, it's very unloving of you to continue to take it. It's unloving to them and it's unloving to you. Mm -hmm. So this inbred codependency in the church where we have to help everybody is really unhealthy. Well, because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Which is imperative for health. You have to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. And I don't mean that like on purpose and being mean. I'm saying right. my grandmother used to say the truth only hurts when it needs to. <laughs> I like that because when you speak the truth in love, look, some people are going to go, oh, okay. And it's going to start a process. Others are going to yeah. deny it, rationalize it, minimize it, justify it, spiritualize it and move on. Yeah. Not everyone is going to listen to the truth. I spent all these years in counseling and I worked in treatment centers. I've talked to thousands of people who have severe denial mm -hmm. and their denial was so severe, it took them to their grave. That happens. So the idea that God's going to save everybody or God's going to open everybody eye, everybody's eyes or we can, we can make it be different. No, no, you can't. You have to be in touch with what is actually happening rather than rationalizing, spiritualizing, justifying, minimizing, all that stuff, <clears throat> which we all do. Yes, right. We so, just want to decrease the percentages of how much we do it. Gotcha. When we're talking about victim and survivors, uh, is there a spectrum? Oh, totally. Yeah. I think there's a spectrum in everything. <laughs> okay. So uh, like someone can be somewhat victim, somewhat in a survivor. Yeah. Mode. And, and well, so that's just it. You can be like, you know, 90% on the victim side, and you might have one place in your life where you're actually doing a little bit of, of work and, and changing, being more mm -hmm. survivor-like. But if somebody's 90% uh, survivor, I mean victim, mm -hmm. they're not going to have a happy life. It's, it's, it, it takes, you know, 50, 49.9% out of uh, uh, victim and into survivor for that to, to really start to manifest in your life in a way that's transformative. Gotcha. All right. Last sign, 10 signs you are a victim. Number 10, you tend to harm others in your attempt to get help. Yeah. So this is what you, your question was just a second ago, Amber, like, do they know that they're wearing people out? No. And this is the harm they do is that mm -hmm. they're not they're in a healthy relationship. You have mutuality exchange. One person talks about something, the other person talks about something, and there's actually a, a growth that happens. There's a, there's a maturity that takes place in those conversations. When you're talking about somebody who's in that survive, um, uh, victim stance, what they're doing is just spinning on it. And so in their attempt to get help, they're actually doing harm, not to themselves, but to other people because of the nature of their pull. And this is something I would tell people. It's a, a free counseling tip. Um, one of my mentors years ago said he's really, it was Dr. Larry Crabb. He was very perceptive and obviously very smart, but he used to say like, when I sit down with someone, one of the things I'm, when I'm paying attention to is what is their pull? What are they pulling on me for? What's, what is there? Is, is there a pull? You know, you had to pay attention to that um, mm -hmm. because that's important to know, right? So if somebody's always pulling on you, they may be in a victim place, okay? But don't assume that it's your job to help them. Mm 
Yeah. You can file that information away and go, okay, that person's not really changing. And then you got to pay attention to your own gut. Is it something I want to get involved in or not? Yeah. And that's your choice. You don't have to get involved. That's, mm -hmm. it's not your job. And if they start making it your job, this is the harm I'm talking about. Yeah. Family they or not, right? What's that? Family or not also. Well, yeah. yes. There's no and, obligations. In particular, you need to have this very clear in the family because there is a lot of power in those familial relationships like mother father you know like m my parents were very harmful but i had a belief that that was normal or it's what i had to take or it was it was my responsibility and, and coming out of that has been radically healing for me to recognize i'm not responsible to be hurt by anybody i don't yeah. have to be in relationship with anybody okay. that's not a requirement in the church we put a lot of pressure on people yeah to stay in relationships Yes, I noticed in Pathway to Hope, a lot of the women in there, not only are they getting out of unhealthy, like relationships with their partners mm -hmm. in marriages, but also it starts the process of doing that with family members also. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, um, you know, back to my two rules, no crazy loud, and I get to decide what's crazy. And that's something that in an abusive um, relationship, you don't have the choice to do. Yeah. Your only job is to com is to comply. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of recap over these again. Okay. Uh, the first part, which was 10 signs you were a victim. One, you complain rather than act. Two, talk about the same problems over and over again. Mm -hmm. Number three, you're ne never able to get to resolution. Number four, you're always looking to people to save you. Number five, you don't accept responsibility. There's always someone or something to blame. Number six, you take more than you can give. Seven, you are uncomfortable with being emotionally well. Mm. Number eight, you are in crisis more than not. Nine, you make people around you tired. Mm -hmm. Number 10, you tend to harm others in your attempt to get help. Mm -hmm. So on to the next part, which is 10 signs you were a survivor. First one we have is number one, you are behaviorally active in moving toward hope. Okay. So behaviorally active, what does that look like? So let's put it in context of, let's say an addict, right? They've lost control of their lives to addiction. And then they recognize that it's hurting them and the people around them, not somebody twists their arm into treatment. Mm -hmm. They recognize it. And then they take action behaviorally. They stop drinking. Or using drugs they go to aa or na they start to you know uh make amends to the people around them that they've harmed so they start taking very specific behavioral action to move them towards a more healthy life mm -hmm. um and so you take it like like they take it in like in a marriage situation someone has consistently harmed you right if they recognize that they're harming you again they're not told that they're harming you and then they do something because that's generally a false change because they had to be told if someone loves you and they're harming you, you shouldn't have to tell them they're harming you. If you do tell them you're harming you and they just keep going, well, there's a sign, right? Yeah. So behavioral change is you take action behaviorally, whether that means, you know, changing your diet, uh, changing your friend group, uh, changing your job, mm -hmm. whatever you, there's a behavioral evidence that you're moving in a direction that's healthy. That makes sense. Ten as signs opposed, of as opposed to the just complaining. Oh. Mm -hmm. there's, there's action. I'm taking a risk. I'm moving. Mm -hmm. Ten signs you are a survivor. Number two, you are willing to sacrifice what's necessary for change. Mm -hmm. So change does not happen because it falls down on you and you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Change is going to require a sacrifice of something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and more importantly, it's going to require risk. It's my belief that nothing changes without risk. Mm -hmm. And when you've been in a harmful environment, one of the things you don't want to do is take risks. So when we start taking risks, this is really a profound part of our healing because it helps us change the message in our minds about what's really happening.
Because mm-hmm. before the risk, my mind's on fire about all the terrible things that are going to happen. Yeah. And I take the risk and actually it works out for my benefit. Oh, now I have some evidence that things are not the way I've been trained. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's so important that we take those risks and we do those things because otherwise we stay in the excuse making and the avoidance. Mm-hmm. Okay. 10 signs you are a survivor. Number three, you are willing to be uncomfortable for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. No quick fixes. Everybody wants a quick fix. I want a pill. Just give me the pill and I'll be okay. But real change means extended uncomfortableness. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. So what you see a lot of times is people have a revelation. They start to change. It gets really hard and then you just go back. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to do it. And they're making a behavioral decision, like I'm going to avoid it. And then other people, you know, I always use the example of the guy who got his arm stuck in the rock and then sawed it off and walked to the hospital. You know, that is evidence of he is going to take action and he's going to be uncomfortable over a long period of time, the rest of his life, probably because he won't have an arm, Mm -hmm. you know that willingness to take those risks and move towards what's good for you, even though it's painful. Yeah. You're, you know, as we go down the list, you'll see some others will, will layer into that, but yeah. Yeah. And this is something we see a lot of in pathway to hope is like oh women God. making these yeah. huge jumps away yes. from these horrible situations yes. and they don't even really know where they're going to be sleeping the next third or fourth night, but they yeah. know that at least I'm going to stay in the hotel room for these three nights and yeah. then we'll see what happens from there. I mean, yes. the amount of courage and risk that they take in all that while, you know, being told by family members that what they're doing is wrong and yes. you know, no support. Right. And exactly. a lot of them have children. It's a story yes. after story that we see in there. Well, and that's one of the beautiful things about Pathway to Hope from my perspective is what I see in the forums is women in those situations supporting each other. It's it's very different for somebody who's in the situation, who sees it to give you feedback and support as opposed to somebody who doesn't. Like I've been in it so I can say it, but when you're in a group of people who understand the nuances of that, that kind of support is is priceless. It's invaluable. Well, and they're all in different phases. So yeah. some of them have just got out at the same time too. And they're like, yeah. me too, girl. Like, you yeah. know, we got this. Mm-hmm. And then other ones have like, I've been out five years. It's amazing what you guys are doing. And this is where I'm at now. So like, there's the hope. And yes. then there's ones that haven't even started. And they're like, wow, like, you know, <laughs> people are actually doing this. Maybe I can too. Yeah, so exactly. It's, it's really so beautiful. Cool I, I am always just so amazed at the courage and the, the beauty of the women that we have the privilege to work with. Yes. Yeah. And and they are, like you said, uncomfortable in those times. It's so, um, there's not a whole lot of stability. I don't really know where they're going to go next. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I say all the time, no one is going to willingly walk into a buzzsaw. <laughs> yeah. There has to be some profound motivation for any of us to walk into that kind of difficulty. But yeah. I'm here to tell you my favorite quote from M. Scott Peck, the avoidance of pain is the beginning of all unhealthy behavior. If you want to be well, you have to stop avoiding the difficulty. Yeah. If you don't want to be well and you want to not have peace, fine. Free country. Go ahead. I I don't care. But don't don't think that you're going to get to peace through avoidance. Doesn't work. I tried it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Ten signs. You are a survivor. Number four, you do not give in to fear. You may have it, but you aren't controlled by it. Yeah. So you're never going to be in one of these decisions and not have fear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's normal and good and healthy. The difference is I don't let the fear control me. Yeah. I look it in the eye and I'm like, okay, we'll see you on the other side. We'll see what happens. Because many times I took that risk. I had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, I, 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 you know, I was betting, you know, that it was going to be really bad. And some situations were really, really difficult and really painful. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, The pain of change is leading you to somewhere good. Yeah. Pain of avoidance is just stacking Mm -hmm. and there's no redemption in it. Mm -hmm. So do you want productive pain like working out or do you want unproductive pain like hitting yourself in the head? Mm -hmm. I saw this quote one time that said, um, you know, without fear, where's courage? 
Yes. Right. So I, I love that because in church, it's like um, if you have fear, somehow you believe that God doesn't love you or something. Yeah. I don't know what verse that is, but you know, for me, I'm like always afraid when taking risks. And so it, it really, and I see that all the time in the forums too, at Pathway to Hope, there's these women are scared when they're doing this. It's not easy to get out of these situations to make change, but they do it and they have profound courage. And that's what's inspiring. It I is. Think. To see somebody take the step and, you know, take the risk, that is inspiration. You know, that's why they made a movie out of the guy who cut his arm off. That's yeah. inspirational. That kind of action, that kind of courage, courage. in spite of the fear. Mm -hmm, exactly. It's very, it's very um, inspiring, and no one faces difficulty without fear. Agreed. So the idea that fear is bad isn't true. Fear is real. It's mm -hmm. what you do with it that can be healthy or unhealthy. Rather than it being a moral issue, like God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power and a sound mind. So it's like, but that God, you know, why did you say fear not? A thousand times because he knows that's a real part of life. It's not something he doesn't think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. This world is a difficult place. Mm -hmm. So be courageous and, and be fearful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take the risk and let the fear, let the fear be there, but, but don't, don't, don't wait for the opportunity to come where there's no fear before you take the risk. Mm -hmm. That's another way to avoid. Mm-hmm. Ten signs you are a survivor. We are at number five. You are willing to adapt to the reality that you're in, not the one you hope for. Yeah. So this is like um, you have to stop being in denial about what's actually happening. Look at your life. Is my life really this big of a mess? Yes. What are you going to do about it? Instead of, well, it'll be okay. And it's not really that bad. And it'll, you know, they have this and if I'll talk to that person, it'll be okay. And then I'll do this and I'll do it. And God will overcome and it'll be good. And, and you just rationalize, spiritualize, justify, deny, and minimize your situation instead of living in reality. Listen, you know, you living outside of reality is going to lead you to a very difficult place. If you're in a difficult situation in your life, the best thing you can do is face it. Mm-hmm. Gather some support around you and face it. Avoidance will always lead you to more internal conflict and harm. Mm. Just how it is. Mm -hmm. So you got to live in reality, not the one you are making up in your head. And sometimes what you have to do in that process is get some feedback from people like, what do you see that's going on? And it might click in you that, oh, okay, yeah. It might help you break your own denial. But listen, we all have it. Mm -hmm. I've denied a thousand situations and I've worked through a thousand. It's just mm -hmm. how it is. So okay. don't kick yourself for being out of touch with reality. But when you do see it, take action, mm -hmm. whatever that is. If it, if it's one little itty bitty thing, you know, I don't believe in a static existence. You're not just staying in one place. You're either moving forward or you're mo moving backward. So if you're making one bazillionth of a centimeter of progress, yay, we're moving in the right direction. So no, no, no action is too small. Mm. But a lot of times we want to take big actions and think we're going to get, get it all done all at once. <laughs> that doesn't work either. I'm sorry. Yeah. I tried. It's just exhausting. <laughs> it is. I've, I've tried it. 10 signs, you are a survivor. Uh, number six, you learn from the circumstances that you're in rather than deny them. So there's, there's, there's the um, furthering of, this, of the principle of living in reality. Yeah. So, you know, now, now that I see reality, what am I going to do? What is that, what is that, what is that statement in, in, uh, uh, imply? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You got to start moving, whatever that is. And again, it's, this is one of the problems with lists like this is because everything has a very specific context. Yeah. So, you know, you could talk to a hundred people and, you know, it's all over the place. So I would encourage you as you look at these things to also try to put it into your context instead of like trying. Uh, the other reason I don't like lists is because humans are um, very interested in lists because then they can feel like they, okay, now I know. 
I got five of these and I got four of these and check. And, and so now that I know where I'm at, I feel better because I know, but it doesn't really encourage me to necessarily act. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I say a lot is pain is the thing that will let you know there's a problem. But care, being cared for, being loved, being supported is what allows you to overcome it. And this is what I see, particularly like you're talking about, like with Pathway to Hope and in other areas. I saw it in AA. I saw it in recovery programs where that care really helped that person take the very hard steps of being in their reality and being like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. I got to deal with this. And then starting the process of, of taking very real painful steps to healing. Mm hmm. Okay, 10 signs you're a survivor. Uh, number seven, you're willing to use all of your resources to move toward change. Mm -hmm. No excuses. So whatever I got, I'm putting it in to moving forward. I'm not making excuses. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking um, uh, the easy way out. I'm whatever resources I have, I'm putting towards myself. And so here's the other sort of under the surface reality about this statement is that when I start taking my resources and applying them to my change, my health, what it does is changes your internal value structure. Mm -hmm. When you start treating yourself with value, that's what starts to change you instead of putting it all out there and having myself spin inside. And I can't, what about and should have, would have, could have. And I start taking my resources. I'm like, okay, I got to take care of this and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to apply these resources to my situation mm -hmm. that starts to value you. And mm -hmm. that is the core of change, is you valuing you. Mm -hmm. 10 signs you are a survivor. Uh, number eight, you actively seek help. Yes. So not you don't actively seek help so you can avoid taking action. Mm. You actively seek help. Like, I need a coach. I need an AA group. I need yeah. a I need a membership program for women who are surviving abuse. I need a gym. I need a, a nutritionist. I need a book. I need yeah. And then I'm taking actual steps to do that so that I'm 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 uh, applying those resources and I'm getting the help I need instead of, well, you know, and, you know, I, I could try, but I don't know. And what about and avoiding all of the actual things that are out there that could help you. And mm -hmm. so the other thing is, is you might go towards one thing and you get in the middle of it and you're like, well, this really isn't helping. Well, then you switch like, well, let's try this. So there, there's not a, well, that didn't work. So now I'm giving up. I just, I just switched. Well, now my resources went there. It didn't work. Now I'm where, where, where am I going to go now? Mm -hmm. That's the difference between that and, uh, Totally. And, you know, I, I know the difference because I've done both. <laughs> <laughs> you also talk to a lot of people. <laughs> True, I do. Okay. Over the years, you have. Yes. 10 signs you are a survivor. Uh, number nine, you resist panic and fear. Mm -hmm. So, again, panic and fear are going to present themselves. And that's not a sign of your inadequacy. That's a sign of your courage. That's a sign of you doing something. That's a sign of you moving forward. So just like with fear, it's going to be present. Panic, you know, I felt the anxiety attacks before. Like when I'm, for me, you know, I grew up in an abusive home. And so there were very specific rules that were spoken and or implied that mm -hmm. you had to follow. And if you broke those rules, you're going to get it. You know, you're going to get a physical beating. You're going to get a verbal, you know, lashing and a physical beating. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I started to like break those rules, mm -hmm. the panic was real, Yes. <laughs> but I, I had to go through the panic and see that what that was said to me wasn't really true. If my dad was here, it probably would be true, but it wasn't true in my life in general. Mm -hmm. it was, you know, not everybody was crazy. <laughs> so I'm just saying that. What I see a lot of times people do is the panic comes and they feel like that because they're having a struggle or because it's hard, they think it's the wrong road. Yeah. They think it's the wrong kind of help. Uh, but mm -mm. 
to, to move through that. And then on the other side, you're stronger and, and you're actually more empathetic because now you know, oh, okay, I didn't die. Okay. And then you start to build on that. So that's really important that you, you feel the panic and fear, but you just move into it anyway. Yeah. And again, let's say you have 10 chances to uh, do something and it's panic and fear comes and mm -hmm. you take one of the 10. Yay. Again, mm -hmm. it's about progress. So don't dislocate your hip to kick yourself in the rear over missing nine. Celebrate one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. All right, 10 signs you were a survivor. Number 10, you take hope in seeing even the smallest of changes. Yeah, so this is so important. This is just what I just said at the end of nine. Celebrate. Mm. You know, I had one 30-minute period of time where I felt happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, let's have a Coke. You know, let's let's celebrate. Um, uh, yeah, because that celebration is going to embolden and empower your yeah. ability to continue. Mm -hmm. If you never celebrate, it's just too much drudgery, mm -hmm. too much drudgery. So when you do have even the smallest of successes, when you, you know, somebody, you know, you have to confront them and, you know, you're totally somebody who doesn't want to confront anybody and you say, well, I don't think so. <laughs> you didn't really confront them, but you also didn't roll over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's to celebrate that. So the other thing about that is it starts to make you conscious of what you're doing yeah mm -hmm. and that's really important i also highly recommend always that people document this stuff because in your brain phew, flies away but in two weeks what i wrote two weeks ago is still still there i can i can get to it i can and i can start to see the context so in these yeah. kind of difficult change processes i think documentation and with modern technology you know videos vlogs voice memos there's a thousand ways to do it and you know most people have a device near them that they can use so you can yeah. do it in real time i really encourage doing it in real time because you know then you can hear uh, one of the reasons i love voice memos is because i can hear the inflection in my voice and when i listen back to it later i'm like wow i was really wound up about that or man i was really sad about that or whoa okay i start yeah. to hear things and it's even more when i do a vlog like because i'm seeing myself um, so there's lots of ways to do it, but I highly encourage the documentation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I like what you said in that, um, the celebrations remind you of what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. And then I would say the opposite of that is rather than thinking about what you have to do or still have to do, exactly. you know, like right. the, the log, you mm -hmm. know, right. Which steals your hope and courage. It does. The celebration inspires it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then you're just kind of on this treadmill of like trying to get everything done and then you're just right. exhausted and you didn't even really get to enjoy the process at all. Yeah. 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 All right. So just to recap, 10 things you are a survivor. To, I'm sorry, 10 signs you are a survivor. One, you are behaviorally active and moving toward hope. Mm -hmm. I would say change. Um, I would probably change hope. I would change hope to change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number two, you are willing to sacrifice what's necessary for change. You're willing, number three, you're willing to be uncomfortable for an extended period of time. Number four, you do not give into fear. You may have it, but you aren't controlled by it. Mm -hmm. Number five, you're willing to adapt to the reality that you are not, you are in not the one you hope for. What did I? Number five, you are willing to adapt to the reality that you are in. Oh, not the one you hope for. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Number six, you learn from the circumstances that you are in rather than deny them. Number seven, you are willing to use all of your resources to move toward change. Number eight, you actively seek help. Number nine, you resist panic and fear. And number 10, you take hope in seeing even the smallest of changes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So thanks everyone for tuning in to the Patrick Doyle show. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope it's helpful. Hope it helps you move towards some freedom. And if you would hit the subscribe button, you know, hit the alert button, uh, share these videos with people that you know that might help. 
And uh, if you're a woman in a destructive or you might think you might be in an emotionally abusive, destructive, toxic relationship, check out my uh, website, patrickdoyle.life. There's a lot of great, great information there. I did a whole new video series and um, there's a great support in the community. So um, appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Amber. Bye.